And what is that great name? Jesus. I can't hear you. What is that great name? Jesus. That's the name above all names. The name changes lives. The name that causes demons to tremble. Power in the name of Jesus. So glad you're here at church today, amen. We're going to get into the worship service. We'll be sharing the Lord's Supper. Before I get into all that, uh, Pastor Strickland probably made reference to that little yellow post inside your bulletin. You might want to look at that little blank piece of paper for a moment like you know what you're doing. <laughs> because it's just, what's going to go on that paper is what you put on that paper. It's not for your sermon notes. I'm not going to preach that short. But uh, it's there for prayer requests. Every time we do any kind of special event, any kind of special promotion, we, we, uh, we want people to begin to pray and get ready for those kind of things. We have our national Back to Church Sunday coming up September 16th. Uh, I wanted to do the pastor rap for you, but... Uh, <laughs> to save face and not to cause shame to the name of Christ. <laughs> we let the video do it. But uh, that's coming up. I'm very excited about it. It's going to be a time when we are uh, doing everything we can to reach out to as many people as possible. We ought to be doing that any time regularly. But it is National Back to Church Sunday, and we want to do everything we can in spring in this community to reach as many people as possible. I want you to think about whose names you want to write on that little yellow piece of paper as a prayer request, someone that you would like to bring. And what I'm going to ask you to do at some certain point is that uh, uh, in the service, before we have the Lord's Supper, we always have a time of just uh, of quietness before the Lord and invitation or people can get their hearts right with the Lord and they come to the altar and kneel at their seat. This time we get right individually with the Lord and we'll have that time. But even during that time, I want you to take that piece of paper and be thinking about who the Lord would have you write the name of there on. And once we get to that time of the service, feel free while people are praying, moving around, to come up. This is our, our Jerusalem wall over here. Put the spotlight on that so they can see it real good, would you, Jennifer? And the western wall here, this is an actual photo from the western wall that we have there. And uh, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you'll know that the Jews, they reverently and regularly go up to the western wall, the only remaining wall of Solomon's temple and Herod's temple there. And, they, and some of the stones are from both those time zones and time frames. But uh, the Jews go regularly there to pray, and they take little pieces of paper, and they curl them up in little, wad them up in little tight squares and stick them in the cracks. And they pray and leave their prayer requests there. Well, we're kind of use that as, a, as, as the same thing, but we're going to come and place our prayer requests there on the wall to people that we would like to see in church. All of us know people without Christ, the people that need to know Jesus Christ. We're around people like that. We work with people like that. We have relatives like that, neighbors like that. So I always tell people to think of, in four levels, friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Kind of like friend, F-R-A-N. Friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. Who are those people that you would like to start working on, inviting? Maybe they had not been in church in a long time. Uh, maybe they don't even know the Lord. These are the kind of people we want to reach out. For those who just came to our, our Journey Class 101, you know that one of the things we promote in there is that the type of people we're out to reach in our community are two kinds. They fall into two categories as a church. One, people who don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. We want to introduce Christ to as many people as possible. Church is where the majority of people eventually end up getting saved, by the way, all right? So we want to bring them to church. So we're reaching the lost. But also we say we want to reach unchurched people, unchurched families, unchurched individuals. And that's people just not in church. I don't know about you, but it's a very easy thing to do in the culture we live in. It's so hustle, bustle, rush, rush, rush. It's easy to just start dropping out of church. Satan makes it easy as possible, by the way, all right? We all may have been tempted in those kind of places. You went to a period in your own spiritual life where you were just out of fellowship. We need to be in the body of Christ. We need the fellowship. We need the accountability. We need to worship together. We need to stand together and love God together and be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about there, there, there will be a group of people who, will, who won't do that. They'll, they'll, they'll stay away from the, the fellowship of the saints. The book of Hebrews even talks about that. We, we don't want to be that kind of people, and we want to reach those kind of people, by the way, to bring them in. So I want you to be thinking about who it is you can reach, who you can reach out to, whether your friends, your relatives, your associates, your neighbors. Who are those folks? And really make a genuine, real, conscientious prayer soaked commitment to go after those folks and try to get them in church and be a part of our worship service on that Sunday. We'll be talking about the church body, the life of the church, the necessity that we have as believers to be a part of that. So I really want to encourage you 
to come during the invitation time when people are making decisions. Maybe you need to do that first. That's fine. Maybe you want to come just pray for them here or pray for them over at the wall or whatever. Take and take that little sticky and stick it on the wall. We'll come back through later and use some scotch tapes to make sure they stay on there. I'll be coming into the auditorium as, at both campuses. I'll come in here on Wednesdays or Mondays, and I'll be spending some time in prayer, and I'll be praying for the names that are on that wall with you in agreement with you. I do it out there on Tuesdays. I'll be in the auditorium praying for folks out there that you put their name on that wall. I'll agree with you in prayer. Others will be agreeing with you in prayer. Uh, anytime you want to come up to the church and just pray and just have a little time to pray for some people, feel free to do that. I believe we can do everything possible. We can, we can write them letters. We can send out newsletters, which we'll put it in that. We'll put it on our signs, and we promote it in the neighborhood. But the greatest thing we can do is also pray. Pray and invite. In fact, I'd put it in that order. Pray first, then invite. And just be encouraging people to come. But prayer is one of the great things that we do as the people of God to reach this community. And God has called us as this church not to be nominal, not to sit down and be passive and watch the world go by, but to be radical, to make a difference in the world that we live in. Here's a way we can do that just a tool, but let's use the tool that God has given us to make a difference on this particular Sunday. Come out, be a part. But today, begin asking God who it is to put on your heart and mind and begin to lead you uh, in, in, in your own prayer life to be specific. Ask God to be specific with you about who goes on that list and to bring to your heart and mind the people you need to bring. Amen? Are you pumped up? Are you excited about Jesus? You got somebody you need to bring to church? We know that. Amen? We all have folks like that, so let's make a commitment to do that. And would you turn that down? <laughs> you pay these guys all the money we pay them. Thousands of dollars every Sunday. No, by the way, y'all give it up for these guys. Hey, Amen. They, they do such a great job. I've asked them to stay on stage because we're going to be receiving the Lord's Supper in a little bit, and I've asked them to stay on stage and lead us in some worship while we're receiving the Lord's Supper. So that's why they, they've stayed up there today. Uh, but I do appreciate them. We don't give them a red cent, by the way. <laughs> they do this because they love God. Amen. We all have ministries in the church, and this is they realize is their ministry, and they use their gifts and their talents and their callings in this way, and I appreciate that so much, Sunday after Sunday, week after week. All right? Got that piece of paper? Keep it handy because the Lord may put somebody's name on your heart any point of this service. That's just the way God works. You can turn the sign light off now. Appreciate it. All right, let's get into our message today. By the way, it's good to have my mom and my sister back in the worship service this week. Praise the Lord. Uh, I see we still have a crowd. My brother didn't run everybody off. Uh, I understand he did a great job filling in and preaching for me. Kath and I were coming back from Mexico Sunday morning, so uh, we weren't able to be with you. Our hearts were here, and our minds were with you, and we were praying for the service. And uh, watching it back on YouTube and on the Internet was just a blessing. So you feel that he, he delivered the goods as he usually does. Amen? If you missed it, go to YouTube and find it. You'll see it there. Let's talk about the Lord's Supper a little bit. You know that when we receive the Lord's Supper, it's not something we tack on to a service. It's pretty much our service when we come together. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So we really want to make sure everything we do in our service today and every song, every, every heart, every mind, every thought is just directed to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to read to you from scriptures this morning. Maybe just do a little exegesis on the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll look at these verses that are on the screen. You can get your Bible out and read along if you like. It says, I received from the Lord... That that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then he goes on, and there's a little admonition that he adds to the particular prayer. He says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he doesn't judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you are asleep. But then he goes on to say, But if we would judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. 
So you wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let them eat at home, so you may not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I shall arrange when I come. Let me say first and foremost, when Paul writes this letter to the Corinthians, if you're at all familiar with it, you know it's a letter of rebuke. There's just a lot of things wrong with the church of Corinth. And Paul is giving direction. Some of it's insight, some of it's instruction, some of it's just an outright rebuke where, because there's, just, there's sin, there's some perversion, there's ungodliness, there's bad doctrine. And it's kind of like the church in America today. So he, he's addressing all those issues. And then one of the things he's addressing, because the way they were handling it was ungodly, he addresses them about this issue of the Lord's Supper. You know, there's two things that the Bible points out in the New Testament. We, you, we would call them sacraments, so to say. I know a lot of churches uh, adopt a lot of different sacraments, but... Biblically, theologically, according to the New Testament, there's only two that we as the church, the New Testament church, the body of Christ, that we are to observe. One of the sacraments is what we are doing today. And we're told to do this. The Lord's Supper, and that's the context of our message. The other is baptism. And baptism is a very important uh, part of, the, of, of, of what we do as a church. The first, the sacrament, it has to do with the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the gospel story and the message. It's, it's redemption. It's, it's all about redemption and the price that's been paid for you and I to have salvation and know God. Baptism deals more with the, with the context of uh, identification and sanctification. It's a picture of how we're, we're cleansed and made new and how we're dead and buried and raised to live a brand new life. So one dealing with redemption, another dealing with identification. These are important things that we are supposed to do as the bride of Christ that we have been commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ to do. The church at Corinth knows this, but the way they're doing it is just not righteous, it's ungodly, and there's a lot of things that are going on. And these are beautiful verses when Paul writes and, he, and when they're laid out to here. In fact, some of the most beautiful passages of, in all Scripture are, are given to us right here. As he, he portrays that night in the upper room with the disciples. But they're laid out kind of in, in, in chapter 11 there, surrounded by all this junk that was going on, you know, the selfishness and carnality, and Paul's rebuking them for all these things. But, but it's, it's laid out kind of just like a diamond in the middle of, of the rough of everything that's going on. I shared this morning in our service, if you've ever gone shopping for a ring or for diamonds, one of the things they like to do in the store is they bring out a black velvet cloth and they'll lay it on the counter. Of course, they make sure all the spotlights are on. A lot of lighting in jewelry stores, if you've ever noticed. They want the brilliance of the diamonds to, to shine, to, to, to sparkle to be there. So they'll lay it against something black and dark like that so it even shines more. That's kind of what we see here is this beautiful diamond of the gospel and of that last supper with the disciples and it's laid out on this murky black background and, and it even goes on beyond that. It said in the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, you, you see betrayal, you see, you know, dishonor, you see, you, you see these kind of things that are just unholy and unclean and ungodly. But here in the midst of all that is this beautiful story as Paul relates it. He said, you know, I delivered, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. I received from the Lord. In other words, he gets this from the Lord Jesus directly about what happened. The apostles didn't tell him what happened in the upper room. They could have. They may have probably shared the story later on. But Paul said, I got this directly from the Lord and I have delivered to you. He's not telling them about something new. They should have already been doing this properly, but they weren't. And now comes the rebuke, but he rehearses what the Lord delivered unto him. In fact, Paul, to give kind of a, uh, I guess, a witness to the fact he got it directly from the Lord, the Gospels have not been written yet. Most theologians, at least conservative theologians and, and uh, professors of theology, will tell you that 1 Corinthians, as far as the order of time... This letter was written before the Gospels were written. So Paul's writing the Corinthians at this point, telling about the Lord's Supper, and I guess it's just a coincidence that it lines up with the Gospels so perfectly and so righteously. No, we don't believe in coincidence. It's a God incidence. And so Paul is laying out here this, this, the, of everything that happened in that room. He says, I received this directly from the Lord, and, and, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you. But like the diamond against the black cloth, there's that, that statement again. In the night in which the Lord Jesus was betrayed. Every passage concerning the Last Supper in Scripture has that in it. It contains that part about the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's kind of like that black veil again. Here you have this terrible act of betrayal laid against this beautiful act of sacrifice and absolute commitment versus that absolute non-commitment. This beautiful 
celebration, this beautiful institution of the Lord's Supper laid against this, 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 this terrible act of betrayal. It's kind of like that's the way Satan, you know, the Bible says, in this world sin will abound. But where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. So you have the grace of God. And you see how the gracious, and in fact, I think if you take long enough to meditate on it and realize the environment, the sacrifice of Jesus, the commitment to us, the commitment to his church, it becomes even more obvious and more powerful against the backdrop of betrayal and dishonor. And so you have the Lord Jesus in the night that he was betrayed. He took bread. So we see that in the midst of Satan's absolute worst, the condemnation of the Son of God on the cross, we see God accomplishing his very best, the sacrifice for the redemption of the world through that cross. Now, remember, Jesus is there first and foremost celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples in that upper, upper room. Neither the Gospels nor Paul's account of the, this time gives us any details about the Passover meal. It focuses on these elements that were taken from the Passover meal. And the Passover meal began with the host pronouncing a blessing over the first cup of the red wine and passing it to the, the guests that were there. In fact, as we've shared before, there were four cups of wine that were, that were on the Passover meal table. So he, the first cup is presented with this blessing. Along with that, there's, a, there's some herbs that are dipped in a fruit sauce, these bitter herbs, and they're eaten. And as they're being eaten and this first cup is passed, then the message of Passover. Most likely, one of the children in the family would ask something like this, what is the meaning of this? And then the message and the meaning of everything on the table would be given because everything on the Passover meal table represented the deliverance of the Jews from the hard, bish, bitter cruelty of the Egyptians who held them in, in captivity and bondage. And so the story is given as this first cup is taken. After the first cup was drunk, the bitter herbs were dipped and then and drank. And then the first part of a hymn, the Hallel it was called, which means praise, related to hallelujah, that word. Praise you the Lord. Uh, praise the Lord was sung. And it was comprised from, basically at this part, from Psalms uh, 113 and 114. But the Hallel, if you want to take time to read it, it's a good little read this afternoon. Read from Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. The first part was usually that 113 or 114 that would be sung. After the first cup, then the second cup was passed, and then the host would break bread and pass that unleavened bread around for, for everyone to eat at the table. And then the meal proper would be served, all right, which was the main course of this was the roasted sacrificial lamb was eaten. Remember, at Passover, the blood of that lamb had to be sprinkled on the door, and then they ate the lamb, and it was to be eaten in whole. The third cup, after the eating of, the, uh, of, of the, the sacrificial lamb, was passed, and then the rest of the hallel, the, the praise song, the, the hallelujah song, was, was sung at that point. And then the fourth cup, which, which uh, celebrated the coming kingdom, where Messiah would come and take over the nations and take his seat on the throne of David in Jerusalem, then that would be drunk to celebrate the, the, the celebration of the coming king, the Messiah. Now, it was the third cup, that Jesus blessed. It was the third cup that he said, this is the cup of communion. It says in the same way he took the cup, this is the part after they had eaten, remember it says clearly, after they'd eaten, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now Jesus gives some brief words of warning around this time. He gives some rebukes, some instructions all the way up through 21 that follows this verse through verse 38. And then it says they concluded the meal with a praise, with a hallel, with a praise song. But as you get into the meal, it says at this point, when Jesus took the elements off the table, the, he took the bread and he took the wine, and he gave thanks. In fact, the Greek word for had given thanks is the word uh, eucharisto, and uh, we get the word eucharist from that. It is literally a word which means thanksgiving, to give thanks. A lot of people talk about the eucharist, referring to the communion or to the Lord's Supper, to the body of Christ, but it's the time of thanksgiving. Everything we do here today in celebrating the Lord's Supper and taking the Lord's Supper together should have a resounding thank you in it. It should be in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The bread that represented, that, that spoke of here, it represented ultimately the, the exodus of the children of Israel from the land, but it really represents in this part and portion where Jesus says, this bread is the body, my body. Now, not literally his body. There, there are those who would try to pretend or to say or to teach that the body becomes kind of mystical, that when you take it, it becomes the mystical body of Jesus Christ. But he never said that, all right? Just as much as the bread represented the exodus, or, 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 you know, of, of, the, of, of Israel, it didn't become the exodus of Israel when they ate it, all right? Neither does the bread become the body of Jesus. This represents the body of Jesus Christ. This is my body. Now, remember, in the Jewish mindset, the body doesn't just represent the body. We think, in the, you know, maybe in, in, the, in the sense of a dichotomy, body, soul, spirit. But in the mindset of the Jewish people, the body represents the total person, the mind, the heart, the soul, the life, the message, the meaning, the acts. In Jesus' case, it represents the great mystery of the, the whole incarnate life of Jesus Christ. It represents everything he did, everything he is, everything he was, his whole de deified body, he, his whole teaching, his ministry, his work, everything that he was, everything that he accomplished, everything that he did. Speaking even of people, we talk about their body of work or their body of this. But literally, when Jesus says, this is my body which is for you and broken for you, he's saying, this is, this is everything I am. In fact, the word broken doesn't appear in the best manuscripts when you read it from the King James. This is my body which is broken for you. Though the Romans frequently, remember, broke the legs of those who were crucified. It wasn't too long ago we did our series on Journey to the Cross. And we spoke about how the Romans, to finalize the crucifixion and to make sure that those people who were on those crosses died, they would come and break the legs. Why? Because to survive the cross, you had to breathe. And the agony of the cross was that being nailed or roped or whatever it was, you had to pull yourself up to get every breath that you would breathe. And then you'd let yourself go. But to breathe again, you had to push up. And so you pushed from the feet. You pushed from the legs. So what would they do? To make sure you died, to make sure you expired, they'd break the legs. So you would die from asphyxiation. You couldn't breathe anymore. You just, you, just, you just couldn't push the pain. The agony was too great. But the Bible makes it clear in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament that Jesus is in prophecy said his, not one bone of his body would be broken when he gave us his, made us a sacrifice. Now, this would be confusing. Probably somebody said, well, he's going to die like this, then he's going to hang on a tree, then his legs are going to have to be broken. But here again, we see a fulfillment of prophecy. In fact, in John 19, it says, not one bone of his body was broken. Now, the best scriptures read like this. This is my body, which is for you. Broken was added to help with the translation because he's breaking the bread there. And as he breaks the bread and passes it out, it's not in the context that his body would be broken, but he would be made available to us and to all who would sit at his table. This is my body, which is for you. And by the way, think about those two words, two of the most beautiful words in Scripture, for you. For you, for me, and for you. Does it get any more rich than that? Jesus saying, this is everything I am. Everything you've seen in me, everything you've heard in me, all that I am, God in the flesh, it is for you. He gave his body. He gave his entire life. He gave everything that he was. I became a man. I suffered. I died. I went to the cross. Why? For you. Gracious, merciful, loving Heavenly Father, how can we ever sit back and have our little whiny pity parties? Oh, why me or why is God letting this happen to me? Hey, everything. You want to know what God's done for you? Go to the cross. Remember today when we take this sacrificial meal of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything it represents, it was for you. Now, obviously, if you want to receive the benefits of the sacrifice that he made, you're going to have to make a decision. But Jesus made this, and he offers it to you. He paid the ransom. The Bible says he died for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. What a mighty God. What a gracious blessing. For you, I've given it. He gives his body, everything that he is, for me. Turn to the person anywhere around you and say, for you. Try the other side. Try behind you. 
Try in front of you. Look at yourself. For me. <laughs> for you and you and you. Isn't that great? Isn't that glorious that Jesus did that for us? Remember, when you look at the cross and you see that bleeding, wounded body hanging on the cross, it's for us. The cup obviously represented the blood of the Lamb. He said he took the cup of the covenant. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. All the covenants of Scripture, whether it's an agreement between kings or God and men, were always ratified with the shedding of blood. An animal would be sacrificed. In this case, the supreme sacrifice, the spotless Lamb of God. John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How did he do that? It's his precious blood. He said, This is the new covenant in my blood. And it's important to realize this. This was not new in the sense it was a covenant of grace replacing one of works. It's, it's new and it's a saving covenant to which everything in the Old Testament points to, which everything in the Bible points to. This is what God has come to do for us. It's the deliverance from sin to salvation. It's deliverance from death to life, from Satan's realm to the glory of heaven. Passover transformed into the Lord's Supper. So now we eat and we drink, not to remember the crossing of the Red Sea and the Exodus, but to remember the grace and the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ who gave everything for us. And it's easy, folks. It's, it's common for people to participate in things ritualistically without participating in their hearts and minds. That's why when we come to the time of the Lord's Supper at Believer's Fellowship, we want to take the service, commit it to it, because we want everything in our hearts and our minds to understand what we're getting ready to do. It's easy to go through the motions many times without going through the emotions of the moment, to see what it represents only, but not realizing that it represents all God has done for us. The Corinthians were coming with a spirit of bitterness and hatred with others and not right with one another or not right with God, had sins in their lives they weren't willing to repent of, and therefore they missed the beauty of what the Lord wanted to do for them and in them and with them. They missed the beauty of the precious sacrifice of the blood. Jesus says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Now, by the way, that's a command from Jesus. In other words, when he says do this, it means that if I come to the Lord's Supper and I don't do it, then that's disobedience. When he says, do this, there's not a little option. And, and I, I, I made reference to this in our first service this morning. A lot of people come to the Lord's Supper and say, oh, we're doing the Lord's Supper today, but I'm not going to take it. That's disobedience. <laughs> Brother Joe, you know, the Bible warns about taking the Lord's Supper with something in your life, and I got something in my life, so I'm not going to take the Lord's Supper. Hey, whether you don't take the Lord's Supper or not, you're still headed for trouble. God still judges disobedience in his children, all right? You're going to have a price to pay. Don't think there's something noble about you not taking the Lord's Supper. The idea is the Lord gives us his supper so that we will remember all he's done for us and we'll remember in such a way it brings us to brokenness. Because here we had this beautiful picture laid out before us of Christ's body and his blood. It ought to do something in us. I'll say, well, you know, I think that we don't understand grace. We think, well, I need to go out for a week or two and be better. Then I can come take it. I'll really prove my love for God. That's the beauty of grace. All right? You don't have to prove anything. Jesus proved everything. Jesus was spotless. His intentions are right and pure and holy. What we ought to do is come to the table like this and realize, oh, I am not right with God. I think I'll get right with God right now. This ought to be a reminder of our relationship and our fellowship. It ought to be a reminder that we can have revival. We can have cleansing from sin, that we can be free so that if we come to the table and say, oh, but, but Pastor, I, I really, I don't deserve. No, you don't deserve. The Bible says don't take an unworthy manner. It doesn't tell you, it, 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 a lot of times we go, well, I'm not worthy. You never will be. Right. Don't think that you're going to go out here and be a goody just enough, nice enough, and sweet enough to everybody, and even just love the people you don't love just enough so that God's going to be somehow impressed with you. It's not going to happen. It's his righteousness which we have, not ours. He gives it to us. So there's no way that if you lived a million lifetimes, you would ever prove yourself worthy because we're just not worthy. We're tainted with sin. That's why we thank God for the blood and we thank God for the cross because he gives us his grace and he clothes us in his righteousness and he gives us what we need to be made acceptable to God because we'll never make it on our own. 
So we ought to come and we sit down this time and say, oh, I see there's something in my life. I don't need to take note. What you need to do is claim the promise of 1 John 1, 9 that says, hey, I am not right with God. I confess my sins. I turn from my sins. I want to get my heart right with God today. And do it with a genuine heart of repentance. It says this is wrong and he's offered so much and I've been so ungodly and I haven't walked with God and haven't been what God wanted me to be. I will get right with God today. So partake in the Lord's Supper, but do it with a heart of commitment and a, and a heart of obedience to the Lord, not with disobedience. Jesus said, as far as often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, why else would we get right? Because Jesus died, the Bible says in 1 John, he died to take away our sins. Let me say that again. Jesus died to take away our sins. Let me say it one more time. Jesus died to take away our sins. Did you get that yet? Jesus died to... If he died to take away way, our sins, why are we still holding on to them? He died to deliver us. He died to set us free, and we can receive his grace and his mercy and his blessings and be made free. That's why we always have a little time of invitation before we receive the Lord's Supper. We want to make sure that our hearts are right, that our life is right. He died to set us free. And he says, as often as you're doing this, you're proclaiming what he did so that we can find freedom and spiritual re release in our life. Now, he says as often as you do this, do it. It doesn't say how often to do it. There's some denominations I know that do it every Sunday, some church. And if, however the Lord leads, obvious the idea here. But whenever you do this, you need to do it righteously. You need to do it with a heart that's right. You need to do it with your sin confessed before God. And you need to do it with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your body, and all your strength. As often as you do it. However often that might be. As often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. It is more than a remembrance for our own sakes. It is a proclamation as we do it for the world's sake. He says, for as often you just, you do preach Christ Jesus. You do preach the message. We're preaching today the message of the cross for others. And then Paul warned them. He says, you know, you don't want to do this with the heart that's not right. If you eat the bread or you drink the cup in an unworthy manner. Remember, he's not talking about you being worthy, unworthy. The manner in which you do it. What, what would be an unworthy manner? I have things in my life that aren't right with God, and I am not willing to get them right. It's not worthy manner. So how do I tell you? I get my heart right. I confess my sins. I repent of my sins. I get, I get my, my life right with him. He says, if I don't, I drink judgment to myself. And by the way, there's a couple of words here in Scripture. One is for judgment is the word krima. There's another word which means judgment translated. It's kata krima. Krima has to do with judgment in the sense he says you should judge yourself. What does that mean? Am I willing to look at my heart and, and be honest with God and say, God, look at me. Is there anything that's displeasing to you? And let God search my heart. And can I pass judgment on my sin? How do I do that? Lord, I've sinned against you. And I want to come to the cross where judgment was given for sin. And place it on the cross. And thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ, your son, forgives me and cleanses me. If we be judged ourselves, we would not be judged. And the word there is crema. We would not be chastened of the Lord. He's saying, if you don't do this, you're going to suffer chastening. Like any good father with his children, there's going, to be, there's going to be a disciplined process. You're not going to be happy. You're not going to experience blessing. You're not going to know the grace of God in your life. All that's going to be religious hyperbole. You're not going to really know what it means to walk with God. But if we would judge ourselves by confessing our sins where judgment was carried out, then I can find freedom. He says, so that we will not be katakrima, so that we will not be condemned with the world. Thank God that Jesus took my condemnation upon himself. And I can honestly judge myself by confessing my sins and being honest with God about my sins and getting my heart and my life right with God. That's why we give a brief time before we receive the Lord's Supper together. And I want you to know today, as we think about all the Lord's done for us and what this bread and what this cup represents, we want to do it in a worthy manner. How's it worthy? It's worthy because we get our hearts right with the Lord Jesus. Would you stand with me? And I want to take a moment of time in this service. Let's just pay attention to what God's saying. And let's realistically, let's, let's judge ourselves. There'll be some men gathered here at the altar as well. If you want to come to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, this is your day. These men will be gathered here. They're glad to pray with you. They're going to share scripture with you. Very briefly show you how you can know Jesus Christ. Everything's been done. It's like this supper. It's waiting.